Dr. Lauren Lownan from Keene State, and this is a short lecture that addresses the ideas of chromosome theory, sex chromosomes, and a little bit more. We're going to talk about what chromosome theory of inheritance is and who figured it out, or at least a couple names in that story. Talk about what this has to do with sex chromosomes and talk about what sex chromosomes are. We're going to talk about the word linkage and we're going to solve a sex-linked inheritance genetics problem and that's going to teach you an example of a human sex-linked condition. So Mendel figured out his laws and we talked about three laws, the law of dominance, the law of segregation, and the law of independent assortment. He figured all of that out without actually knowing anything about chromosomes. Chromosomes and how they move during meiosis explain what Mendel observed. Um, and our understanding of chromosomes, which is today called the chromosome theory of inheritance, was formulated in the early 1900s, some decades after Mendel did his work. Two scientists who were instrumental in developing the chromosome theory of inheritance that did their work late in the 1800s and into the early 1900s were Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary. They are given credit for coming up with the statement that chromosomes are the genetic material responsible for Mendel's observation and therefore inheritance. The chromosome theory of inheritance states several things, um, and it directly addresses um, eukaryotic genetics, even though you can certainly apply this to prokaryotes as if you simplify the cellular processes happening. So chromosome uh, inheritance states that homologs migrate during meiosis in a way that is independent from one another, that homologs separate during meiosis, the gametes are haploid, and the myocytes that give rise to them therefore are diploid, and that egg and sperm have the same number of chromosomes, and that once fertilization occurs you get back to the same number of chromosomes seen in the parental organisms. Those are the ideas behind chromosome theory. It would be remiss of me not to mention Dr. Nettie Stevens, who um, was the person who first discovered the observation, what we now call the sex chromosomes. So she discovered the Y chromosome in the mealworm, which is called Tenebrium molitor, and published that work in 1905. And so she is the one that sort of really set the stage for figuring out um, the idea of linkage, the idea of sex-linked inheritance, um, and contributed a lot of valuable information to the chromosome theory of inheritance. She was from Cavendish, Vermont, which is a reason that I'm bringing her up because she was a New England girl and uh, somebody worth remembering. She worked for a while with an extremely famous geneticist. His name is, or was, Thomas Hunt Morgan. And Thomas Hunt Morgan worked with the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. He did a lot of important and famous work, not least of which is in Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab, many people that went on to make other famous discoveries like Nettie Stevens and Calvin Bridges, who did work as an undergraduate in Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab. He trained a lot of people who went on to discover great things. So Thomas Hunt Morgan both produced knowledge about genetics and also produced other people who were well trained in science and could go on and ask more questions and obtain more knowledge, which is his greatest leg legacy in uh, many regards. So Thomas Hunt Morgan discovered that traits could be linked to sex. Specifically, he noticed that some of the fruit flies in his fruit fly cultures had these funky white eyes. Now most normal wild type or um, Drosophila melanogaster have these brick red eye colors. You might not have noticed that because you might not have looked closely enough at a fruit fly, but if you catch one in your kitchen, they're usually not that hard to catch in the spring once they start multiplying and take a good look at their eyes, they'll generally look like this. In the lab at Thomas Hunt Morgan's facility, he was noticing from time to time that he would see these white eyed fruit flies. And he also noticed that they were usually male. So he captured enough of them and started to do genetic crosses with them. So here we've got up at the top, this is the symbol for male, this is a white-eyed male fruit fly, and on the side this is a red-eyed female fruit fly, and she was true breeding. And the genetic, uh, 
the genotype is indicated here as X, superscript little w. Notice there's that like little funny thing on the, on the w. You can see it down here a little bit better. That's supposed to be a lower case, symbolizing recessive. So on the X chromosome, there's a W gene. It's recessive. Allele is here. The dominant is a big W. It's a little hard to see, okay? And then the male is, of course, its homolog for that particular chromosome set is the Y chromosome. When he goes through gamete formation, he can produce this, and he can produce this. And the W gene is on the X, and so he can only make gametes that have lowercase recessive W gene on that X chromosome. She, on the other hand, makes entirely the same kinds of ga uh, gametes with regards to this gene. X big W, X big W. And here are the results of the mating. These are the possible offspring, and this is indeed what Mendel observed in his lab. He noticed that he saw red-eyed females and red-eyed females and a red-eyed male and red-eyed males. In other words, every single fruit fly in that collection had red eyes. All right, that's fine. So he did a little bit more work on that, not least of which is that he did something called a reciprocal cross. Mendel did these two. A reciprocal cross means you switch the phenotype of interest and how it's assigned to biological sex. So this cross was red-eyed females versus white-eyed males. In the reciprocal cross, you would have red-eyed males versus white-eyed females. And when he did that, he saw something very, very different because the red-eyed males produced different gametes. They would produce X, big W, and Y. And the white-eyed females, because it's recessive, it would be X little W, X little W. They're only going to make X little W here. And so you would see a different pattern in the outcome. See if you can work that pattern and bring it to class. Because what you'll see is you get something completely different. So these genes that Mendel was studying were on the X chromosome of Drosophila. And shown here is one image of an X chromosome for humans. It doesn't have all the genetic content marked on it, but it has some of the content marked on it. And I'm going to draw you attention to a gene called the heme A down here. It's located at the distal end of the X chromosome on the long arm of the chromosome versus the short. This is called the Q arm. And this gene is associated with a genetic condition called hemophilia A. So hemophilia is a group of genetic disorders. And what you have when you have hemophilia is you have, you cannot clot. Your blood does not clot. <laughs> excuse me, appropriately, which means if you get a bad cut or bruising, you'll just continue bleeding for too long to be healthy. So it's a very dangerous condition. There are many forms of hemophilia. Hemophilia A is related to having a faulty or mutant allele that is disease associated on your X chromosome. So it's an example. Hemophilia type A is an example of a human sex-linked trait. Okay, so X-linked hemophilia is due to a recessive allele for a gene found on the X chromosome. We'll mark that as X superscript little h. So a male with hemophilia would have this genetics, this genotype, and a female with hemophilia would be this. When it comes to genes on the X or the Y chromosome, you can't use the words, you cannot use the words homozygous or heterozygous. Instead, when referring to males who are XY, you would call them hemizygous because there's only one copy of the X chromosome, something different. Here's an example pedigree for this type of X-linked hemophilia. Here's a father who has hemophilia. There's his genotype. And here's the mother who does not have hemophilia. And I should have actually wrote this as X big H, X big H up here, okay, just to be clearer, to show which allele of the hemophilia A associated gene she has. Should have been X big H, X big H. When they produce offspring, um, he's contributing the Y chromosome that give rise to these males. They do not have hemophilia because she does not have a hemophilia allele. Okay, it's saying she's not a carrier. She's homozygous, X big H, X big H. None of them have hemophilia. 
These girls, on the other hand, they are going to be heterozygous, and this is a recessive condition, so they're not going to show the hemophilia characteristic, but they can transmit the allele, which means that for each of these daughters, if they have a son, their, their son has a 50% chance of being uh, hemophilia type A, very high chance. Here is a very famous pedigree where the, the condition being tracked is X-linked hemophilia type A. And this pedigree, it's a little hard to see on this. Hopefully you can magnify it on your own screen. This is the uh, British royal family. So this is King Edward and Queen Victoria. And you'll notice neither one of them are marked as, having, as being carriers or having hemophilia A. And the working hypothesis right now is that Queen Victoria, this Queen Victoria, their daughter, um, she developed the mutant form of the hemophilia A associated gene. So she had a mutation event in a myocyte, and that from that point on, the hemophilia A allele is in the British royal family. In this particular pedigree, the half-half symbol is being used to represent carriers the whole, like, completely shaded in means you have hemophilia, and then open means you do not. And if you go through and you look at this, you'll see that only men in the royal family show the condition, although there are many females in the royal family that are carriers for that condition. Sex-linked traits or genes are one form of what is referred to as genetic linkage. So linkage means you're tracking the inheritance of two or more genes and they are on the same chromosome. So they travel together through meiosis and therefore you, if you inherit this big C, you also inherit the big D, okay? And sex is a condition associated with having the Y chromosome in humans, right? And, and X is another sex-associated chromosome. So for any gene that is on the X chromosome, it's going to be inherited in a pattern called sex-linked inheritance. So there are also uh, genes on all the other chromosomes, the autosomes in the human body or in, in other organisms, and those genes are all linked to the other genes that are on the same chromosomes. And this is something we would get into more in genetics class, but we might ask questions like, if A and B are on the same chromosome, in other words, they're linked, what are the gametes that big A, little a, big A, big B can make? And in what proportions? And what you will find is this organism will make the exact same classes of gametes, whether A and B are on the same chromosome or whether A and B are on different chromosome. What changes is the proportions. So you'll still get big A, big B, little a, little b, big A, little b, little a, and big B as your four possible gametes for this. But what you'll see is that you will have decreased amounts of gametes that are in the group called recombinants and a greater proportion of gametes in the group that are called um, non-recombinant or parental. And that's something you'll learn more about if you take an actual genetics class. For now, I want you to remember that when genes are linked on the same chromosome, then they travel together and it affects the patterns of inheritance that we see. Those would then not be considered Mendelian patterns. And that concludes this lecture.